Brother Rauch and Maria Rauch was able to come up here. They're missionaries to Zambia. I don't know if y'all remember him. They have visited the church before. I'm going to turn it over to you, brother. Well, good morning to everybody. It's good to be back here and see some of you. I don't, you know, at this age you don't remember everybody, so you have to forgive me for that one. But anyway, it's been a couple years since we've been here. Uh, 2019. Yeah, August, August 2019. And so uh, I'm Charles Rouch. It's my wife, Maria. We are veteran missionaries to the field of Zambia. And somebody asked me a while ago, I said, well, what's your plans for getting back? I said, I wish I knew. You know, it'll depend on how things are going over there. Right now we're still on a Category 3. And so we're, we're not going to go back on a Category 3. So you guys pray for us that God opens that door for us to get back home. We're going to show the video here in a minute. My wife runs that thing. And then she's going to give you a testimony. Uh, and it, it is uh, something that we found that the Lord really does use to be a blessing to people and challenge you that, you know, if God can use any of us, uh, He can use you. Amen? Okay, y'all, we're going to have to wake up here, okay? Amen? There you go. That's more like it. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and show you the video because if I start talking, I'll chase rabbits. So this will uh, answer a lot of questions you might have and will show what great things God has done. And that's what we need to uh, spend our time thinking about. Amen? So we'll go ahead and show you the video, and then my wife's going to give a testimony before Pastor comes and has the Sunday school lesson. God has a big plan. When he closes one door, his eternal plan includes his children to surrender and walk through the next door that he opens for them. We would like to tell you a story, his story. But first, a couple of questions. Do you believe in missions? Do you believe that God's plan really works? The story begins in scripture. God promises if we surrender fully to his will, he will be honored and he will do exceeding, abundantly, above, all that we ask or even think. Now, God's unfolding story in us and in ministry. Many years ago, God opened the door for his gospel to openly penetrate countries into Eastern Europe where communism had tortured and killed so many and tried its best to completely obliterate Christianity and God's word. But God stepped in. Churches in America quickly responded by sending missionaries to carry out the Great Commission in those countries. Among the fruit of that obedience, God called Maria, a young single Romanian lady, to go to Bible college in Romania and become a missionary. Many said it was impossible. However, following God's call and to our knowledge, Maria became the first Romanian missionary to be sent out from a local Romanian Baptist church to a foreign country. Maria has now been in Zambia for 20 years, faithfully working alongside other Baptist missionaries. Seven of these 20 years, Maria lived in the village among the people. Many times over the years, Maria was asked to teach in our own Bible Institute and has been called upon many times by our pastors to travel to the churches, teach women, work with youth, start preschools in the churches, and teach life skills. God led Maria to also develop her own ministry called Hands of Mercy and Grace Ministries, ministering to and working with orphans, widows, the elderly, battered women, and teach leaders. Several months after I returned to Zambia to continue ministry, the Lord began to work on my heart as well as Maria's. That it was his plan for us to marry and continue faithfully in his call upon our lives. We were married and it wasn't long until Hands of Mercy and Grace officially teamed up with Lighthouse Bible Baptist Outreach of Zambia. This term has been one of the most productive terms in 25 years of ministry in Zambia. Many souls have accepted Christ 
and discipleship continues on a regular basis. Bible Institute classes are fewer at the mission now, but that's a good thing because many of the pastors are beginning their own Bible Institutes in their own churches and locations. This has been the goal from the beginning and is far more practical and effective. One of the areas God brought the most impact this term was a different class for our Bible Institute. Maria asked me to assist her in a cooking class for those in ministry. Now, although this seemed totally out of the box to me, I agreed to try it. Only God knew what was about to happen. Almost every pastor and his wife signed up for that class. However, this three-hour class quickly morphed into a six-hour class with the pastors and their wives who began to deal biblically with ungodly traditions and customs that the majority of African families still struggle with in their homes and churches every day. And this prevents God's greater blessings in their lives. Although I still seem to burn the chicken, God put Maria and I into the deep areas of the lives of these pastors and their wives, where they really live on a daily basis, a level beyond things dealt with earlier in this ministry. The response was overwhelming. Another great blessing this term was the beginning of a new church. Sobe Baptist began as a result of leading a man to Christ in the bush near a safari camp about an hour away from the mission in Andola. After accepting Christ, David pleaded to be taught God's Word. In one year, this small Bible study, made up of family members and neighbors, grew to a church family of about 30 people. The camp directors invited us to use three of their new school rooms for the services. This was a great blessing. This term, the building projects have continued, and they continue while we are on furlough. The building projects seldom move forward as quickly as we would like to see them, but we hold that they, the people, must do much of the work on their own if they are to appreciate and maintain those buildings later. While we are on furlough, the entire ministry, including the churches, Bible Institute, orphanage, building projects, government paperwork, and the mission compound are all in the hands of the Zambian pastors and the leaders of Lighthouse and Hands of Mercy. They are responsible first of all to God, then the missionaries for all of the areas of ministry. This is vitally important to develop greater trust in God, accountability, integrity, and faithfulness. Just before furlough, our largest graduating class ever graduated from the Bible Institute and received their diplomas. Maria and a friend made all of the new graduation robes for the big event. As always, there was a lot of food and fellowship. Our oldest graduate was Brother Costa, who is 86 years old and received the Epaphroditus Award for 20 years of faithful, unwavering service. We want to thank all of you for your continued prayers and financial support for the precious souls of the Zambian people. We do serve an awesome God, and we are privileged to have you by our side in ministry. God bless you greatly. I do know we serve a great and mighty God, and I know some of you are wondering, what is she doing here? I don't know. God knows. I want to start with the story because there are some small children and... Uh, just bear with me, and then I, I have to transition because I see there are some young people, youths and seniors. So it's going to work for everybody. A cup of coffee, a donut, and some lollipops for the kids, I guess. When I first went in Zambia, it was 1999. To some of them, they look like, wow, that's a long time ago. Uh, and I do remember first time when I went to Zambia, I started working with children, and children ministry is different. You kind of gather kids around and say, okay, let me tell you about God. And I say, okay. And we sit under a tree, mango tree, or 
many places during the week or whenever we meet Saturday, Sundays, whenever you can meet with children, they will follow you. So there were hundreds of people following me one day and we were following a small path and the grass was very big. And as we kept walking, walking, the kids were so happy. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to follow. They call us white people muzungus. So we're going to follow this muzungu. And they were very excited. I said, I'm going to tell you about God. And they kept following me until we found a nice spot. And while we kept walking through, the grass grows very big. And there was a little child, maybe five, six years old, and had a little dead bird in his hands. And as the little boy kept walking with the dead bird, I was thinking, who knows what he's doing with the little bird? And kept walking and kept it so carefully. And the bigger boy, like you, very naughty. I don't know if you have to naughty, but this one was naughty. Took the bird away. And the little boy started crying, oh, I took my bird away. And I was thinking, I come from Romania under communists. I thought maybe they'd take it, go and bury it somewhere. And I said, no, no, no. I want my little bird. I'm saying, what are you doing with that little baby bird? I said, ah, that is my lunch. He took my lunch. And I was thinking, what? I'm coming from communists where things are tough, but I'm like, wow. So a little bird was his lunch. I said, hey, you, give his bird away. Give, give it back and let him have his lunch, and you go and find yourself another bird or, or mice or bugs or whatever you can find because they eat everything that has got meat, flesh, it's good. Caterpillars and chonkonono and everything else. And the little boy was so happy he's got his lunch. And I said, what are you going to do with that? I'm going to go home. I'm going to fry it and share it with my brothers and sisters. And I was very touched because we are 10 in our family and my mom taught us to share. But I didn't realize the tiny little thing would be enough for <laughs> many of them. And what's very surprising with the children in Zambia, I have sweets many times and they take a little candy and they put it in their mouth and break it and they start sharing it. Forget bacteria, forget germs, they like it. And they do like to share and they've learned, I'm gonna share this. If I have a little thing of something, I'm gonna share it with, with my brothers and sisters. And to me it was really touching to see them eating things that coming from a communist country was like really, Surprisingly, another time I was with kids again, and one of them was eating something in his hand like you are eating peanuts. And I said, what are you eating? Oh, this is so good, it's chonkonono. And we were eating with so much appetite. And the mother said, wait, wait, I'll bring you some. And I was visiting with an American friend of mine that she was more senior. They said, oh, this is so good. It tastes like bacon. And I believe her. Yeah, don't believe them. And I believed my friend, and she said, this is so good. And they, the mother came with a handful of chonkonono. And I, they said, it tastes like bacon. And I looked like, wow. It was uh, locusts. They call it chonkononos. And my American friend said, take it and eat it at one time, and it tastes like bacon. And I thought, I'm very smart. I took the head off, I threw it, and I ate the rest, and got stuck in my throat like, Thank you, thank you. And next time, it was a locust, fried locust, and they really like it. I said, hey, it's protein, it's food, it's good eating. I'm like, thank you, may God bless you. But next time when somebody said, come and eat with us, I'm vegetarian, no more meat, because you never know, you might eat bush rods, you might eat anything that flies. They call it meat bush, and when they say meat bush, it can be anything. I'm not talking about deer and bears or whatever you got, everything. So that was my first experience of kids eating stuff that we're not, I'm like, we don't eat bugs in my country, we don't eat caterpillars, we don't eat flying ants, we don't eat stuff like that. And I grew up under communist, and my mom used to say, as for me and my house, we should serve the Lord. And every day, since I learned how to read, I took the Bible and started reading it. Every day was normal to us to read the Bible and pray. Even though I was under communist, and you couldn't 
Many preachers in those days got put, uh, they went to jail and they never saw their families. They end up killed in jails. Or some of them, there were times when they, somebody could have come to a particular church and said, are you a Christian? And if you say yes, they say, I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to put a bullet in your head. You got to deny Christ now. And those are times when either you're a Christian or you're not, you couldn't fake it. Because if somebody puts a gun in your head and say, if you're a Christian, I'm going to kill you, most of you say, no, no, I'm just visiting here. I'm just passing by, passing through, and they go. So you needed to learn. Either you know God and you have a relationship with him. I say, you know, it makes no difference what people say. I'm going to believe in God. And even as a small children, we are taught there's no God. Everything just happened, and they're teaching you not to believe in God. And even through school, as I grew up, I, there were times I say, look, you cannot have this position, or you cannot do this in classroom. You can't be this or that unless you deny Christ. And I do remember one time the, a teacher told me, if you want to have a position in this classroom, you've got to say, I'm not a Christian. I don't care what you do at home. But you need to say, I'm not. And he said, I'll give you one week to decide whether you're going to be a Christian or not, whether you believe in God or not. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't need a week. I can't tell you it's not God because there is a God. And I've learned from my mom as a small child. As for me and my house, we will serve God. And mom always brought us around. We're 10. I said, we're going to go to church, we're going to serve God, and we will read the Bible, and we follow everything God says in the Bible. Not what people say, not what they think. And even though things are different, because they will call you repentant, apocalypse, or they will say, no, you are repentant, go away. We don't want, we want nothing to do with you if you are a Christian. Majority of people were afraid to serve God. And even to get saved, like, if I go to church, they might kill me, or I'm going to lose my job, or I'm going to lose my position. But through it all, we learn it's okay. God is God. He created it all. And I do remember praying as a very young child. I, I read lots of books about David Livingston and missionaries. And I said, God, one day you are God of impossible. All things are possible with you. And I, I got saved when I was 12, and as I kept growing up reading the Bible and books about missionaries and uh, godly people, I said, I want to serve God. I know I'm a woman. I'm, I know I'll never be a man to preach. And I said, why didn't you make me a man? I have a twin brother, and he said, I want to be a girl. I stay at home, cook, and be a girl. I said, I want to be a man. I want to go out there and preach and teach the... Uh, 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 God, you made a mistake with me. He wants to be me. I want to be him. And then I learned, no, God makes no mistakes. And even though um, I, in our culture in those days, they say, okay, a woman should stay home, have babies, and get married, and that's it. And a man should go and preach. Women are kind of, some of you remember those days where women can't do this, women cannot do this, women cannot do ministry. And I say, you know what? God said in the word of God, you shall go and preach everywhere. And I said, God, I'm not a man, but I can still get involved in church. I can still do something. And I kept praying, Lord, I really want to be a missionary. I know it's impossible because uh, those days they will never let you travel outside Romania. But I know, God, you can open a door. And I do remember in, in, uh, when revolution came in, in 89, God opened a door. And uh, they killed the president, and then a new president came, and they opened the door of the country, and that's when America started sending missionaries to Romania. And through one of those missionaries was, started a Bible college, and I went to the Bible college, and I, she, he said, what are you doing here? I just want to learn more about God. That's all. I said, okay, then you know the right place. So in a Bible college, I remember when... I, one time when I was a teenager, I looked at the sky and said, Lord, all things are possible with you. I looked at the sky and said, God, you can open this door for me and allow me to be a missionary. I know I'm not going to be a man, but you can still use me. And being again in a Bible college, I remember what I prayed when I was much younger. And I said, I'm in the right place. I'm in a Bible college. I'm going to learn more about God. And at that college, I've learned that, you know, God can use women. And I do remember 
just uh, as I finished the Bible college, there were some missionaries coming to Romania from America. So America sent a lot of missionaries to Romania. And I've learned that, you know what, I can also be used by God. I might not be a man, but God can still use me. And that's when I said, Lord, you show me where you want me to go. And we were at the conference, Romanian conference for blankets, technically Americans from Europe. And God spoke to me, I want you to go to Africa. And I said, Lord, why Africa? And I felt like God said, if you go to Australia or America, everybody say, yeah, that ain't missionaries. You're just going to a better place. But Africa, it's worse than Romania. And if I send you to Africa, everybody can say, yeah, she went where I sent her. She's not going to America as a missionary. She's going where God sends her. And within a year, I start praying, Lord, send me where you want me to go. Africa is big, but where should I go? And God opened the door to Zambia. And during, I see there are young people here, and I do remember in those days, many of my colleagues in a Bible college said, ah, you got to get married. If you don't get married here, you ain't going to get married with a black man in Zambia, or you're never going to get married. God is not going to give you a man. Well, what are you thinking? I say, you know what? If God sends me to Zambia, he's going to have the right person at the right time for me. And if that, it's okay. I'll wait. I did not know I'm going to wait that long. I waited a long time. And I trusted God. And I didn't listen to what my colleagues were saying. I said, I'm going to go to Africa because that's where God wants me to go. And I started teaching the young kids in schools and young girls. And then God opened another door. Somebody asked me, why don't you come and teach ladies to sew or do something? I paid for a, a Zambian woman to do uh, some classes tailoring and halfway through she quit i'm like okay i can't do this i can't pay a lot of money for somebody if they quit and i decided i, I said god if you give me money give me 500 dollars and i'm gonna go buy sewing machines and i go and teach the women in the church and within a few weeks god gave me somebody said hey i'm gonna send you 500 dollars okay i'm gonna i uh, took all the money and got sewing machines and taught the women how to do sewing and they taught other women and then somebody said why don't you take these women to a cooking class and let them learn how to cook because besides uh, all kind of weeds and um, pumpkin leaves and green stuff and frying chicken. They don't know how to cook a, a variety. And I gave somebody $500 and they had a seminar for three days. Five women. I said, what did you learn? Well, we learned how to cook rice and we saw how you can make bread and samosas. I said, what else? Well, not much. That's it. And then somebody said, why don't you pay 500 again to teach them? Let them learn. I said, now, with $500, I'm going to feed a whole village. I'm going to, and I took the money and taught women how to cook. And that's how cooking classes started, because they said, we need to learn how to bake. We got to learn how to cook. We got to learn different things. And while teaching them how to cook, this is not America. You take the chacos, you put on the braids, and you wait for chaco for half an hour, an hour, for... I know the older people know what I'm talking about. The younger people are, what is she talking about? You take the wood and wait for the wood. I say, okay, now we're going to cook rice, for example, or some kind of soup or gravy. While that stuff is cooking, I took the Bible, started teaching about God. And they needed to wait until the food is ready. So I had two, three hours to teach them about God. If I told the women, hey, let me teach you a women, a women class, a Bible study, and not many will come. Okay, I'll teach you how to cook and bake. And we spent four or five hours teaching about God constantly, and they will ask questions, and it was nothing formal. But I realized, huh, I can use different skills, and they'll come and learn, and then we eat and fellowship and go home, and they will ask questions. And I, uh, some of these classes that you've seen have come out, out of necessity. There was a need, and God used those as a platform to teach the Word of God. And um, I do remember God using in different things like that. And then when I got married with my husband, he, I said, would you want to do a cooking class? He said, I can make cooking. 
I can do peanut butter and jelly and fry eggs, and that's pretty much it. But it was not about cooking, per se. It was more about that's where God allowed us to teach the people, and they kept asking questions that normally people would not ask questions. And God used different things as a platform, but the basics was the Word of God. And we've seen people uh, talking. Yeah, we ended up counseling uh, people in a church, like you tell young people, hey, do you need counseling as a couple? No, no, show up. But say, hey, we're going to have a cooking class as a couple. And we were bombarded. And then we had them for five, six hours, almost a full day, constantly talking about the Lord. And yet eating and learning a few things. And God, I got about five, ten minutes to go. And I just want to bring the story. Pastor Sam is okay. I got five more minutes, right? At least. And I kept waiting up on the Lord, and I, because there are some young people again. I do remember one time in 2016, I went by this lake with, with the church. They said, let's have a church as a picnic by the lake. And I looked at the sky again and said, Lord, I came to Africa in 99. I was 26 years old. Now I'm not getting any younger. And you said that if you delight yourself in me, I'll give you the desire of your heart. Lord, you haven't given me the desire of my heart yet. And I immediately, I felt like God said, wait up on me. Wait for one year, and I'll give you the desire of your heart, and I'm going to, I will give you a husband that you're not going to feel sorry about it. And I said, okay, Lord, another year. Well, I waited all these years. What's, what's the big deal one more year, you know? And I said, Lord, you said in the, in your, in the word, delight thyself in me. And I felt like God said, spend one year again with me. Spend as much time you can reading the Bible, fast, pray, and delight yourself in me. And my friends kept saying, oh, you're getting old. I'm going to hook you somebody or do this or do that. So, uh-uh, no, no hooking, no, nothing. I'm going to let God be my, my matchmaker. God knows exactly the desire of my heart, and he's gonna, he said that he's going to give me the desire of my heart in one year. And that was 2016. And I kept waiting, I kept waiting. I said, God, time is ticking. <laughs> that 2016 was over. Now it's 2017. And that was in July 2016 when I felt in my heart that God said, I'm going to give you the desire of your heart. And I waited. I said, okay, Lord, I'm, I'll keep the, but you're late. <laughs> and now it was 2017, January and February, and I started praying and fasting. In May, at the end of May, I received a call, and there was my husband, and I said, would you want to go out with me for a cup of coffee? There's not much in Africa. All you can do, have a cup of coffee, and not much. And I said, no, I'm sorry. And then I felt like the Holy Spirit said, okay, don't just leave it there, because if you tell him sorry, it means chapa, kaput, finished, finito, nothing else. And I said, well, I'm starting a fast tomorrow. That's why I can't go with you. But if you're going to wait until I finish the fast, I'd love to go for a cup of coffee. And I, he said, okay, I can wait. And he said, how long is that fast? I said, oh, only seven days. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll wait. So I kept praying and fasting. And I said, Lord, do not let me make a mistake. I don't want to be in a marriage where it's we're just friends. You go in your room, I go in my room. I want to be with somebody that we enjoy life. And I said, it's not about the way we look. It's not about... Most of the times we just do things with our brain, not with our hearts. I said, Lord, I just don't want to make a mistake. And I waited and I prayed. And seven days later, I said, Lord, if this is you, you open our hearts. And you show both of us that that is you. And you put us, you, you are the matchmaker. You put us together. We're not putting each other. We're not trying to find a, a mate. And I prayed, and I prayed and fasted. And when we met for the first time, of course, we knew each other since 99. So it's not like we did not know each other. And we enjoyed talking. And I said, okay. And then next month, I said, Lord, if this is you, you make it work. And I do remember that was pretty much towards the end because I did know in my heart, God said, I'll give you a desire of your heart within one year. 
And in July was the last time I was fasting for seven days and really spending time with the Lord. And suddenly I said, Lord, if this is you, put love in my heart for him and put love in your heart, in his heart for me, and you make it work because I am not a matchmaker and I don't know how to do it. But you know how to do this. And then guess what? In July, that was one year since God said, I'm going to give you a desire of your heart. In July, we went out for a day, technically the first day when we went out. And we went out. He took me out exactly to the same spot where, was, where the lake was. He had no idea. And he took me out in that, uh, by the lake, and they had a safari. I said, do you like safari? Sure, let's find some animals. And he started driving around in a safari with a mop that was drawn by somebody, and we couldn't see any animals. And that was exactly one year when God said, I I'm about to finish. <laughs> uh, that was exactly one year. And while he drove, he said, if you get married, where do you want to get married? Romania, Zambia, or what? I'm like, well, I don't know. No one has asked me ever before. And then he stopped the car and said, would you want to marry me? And that was history. And later on, he found out that that was exactly the same place where God told me, wait up on me. I'll give you the desire of your heart. Same place, same location. We got engaged in July 10th. And in August, we're married, and the rest is history. And God is God, because he put it together, and I'm done. And same thing with them. It's God doing it. We didn't do nothing. We just came around and kept on moving. And when we do follow God, God has given us the Holy Spirit to all of us. And he speaks even today. It makes no difference who we are, what we're thinking. He knows the desire of our hearts. And my husband said, that's it. And Zambians will say chapa, and may God bless you. One of the most powerful testimonies I've ever heard was from a missionary's wife named Ida White. Ida White was a uh, woman that was in, I want to say, where, where is she from? Palestine. She's a Palestinian. And she married an American soldier who got her out of that, and then th he became a missionary to Israel. So she's a Palestinian married to an American that's a missionary to Israel. She had some interesting things. Now some of you might be thinking about the passage, a woman should keep silent in the church. But you all read the context of that. That's to teach men. Women aren't supposed to usurp authority, but they can testify, and there's many things they can do. Matter of fact, you read in Acts 21 about four daughters that prophesy, and that's in the time of the local church. So, so be careful before you take and jump to too much conclusion and not have some grace on that. There's many things you can learn if you'll just swallow a little bit of pride, and stop and listen to people testify how God has used them. And God used her in Africa. He used my wife up there in Romania, working with children, working with women, being an example. And you ladies, God can use you if you'll just surrender and allow God to use you. And I'm, I'm a show for this. I'll just say it. I am. And if God can use a lady, he can use you if you'll be the right kind of man. But if you're not the right kind of man, God will get a lady. If you're a coward like Baruch in the Bible, he says, I won't go unless a woman... He'll use the woman over the man. Amen? And sometimes he has to. Sometimes he will. He'll say, hey, you won't go. I'll pick her. She'll go do it. I'll get her to do it if you won't do it. And that ought to be a shame to some men. And I'll be ashamed. But uh, that's, a, that's a blessing to hear that. I've asked Brother uh, Rouch to preach for us on the second service. And he's going to preach for us. But we, I thank you for that testimony. That is a blessing to hear. And it should give you an appreciation of what God has given us, the opportunities. We have great opportunities in this country. 
We don't have to worry about the gun to our head because we're a Christian. Maybe if you don't get vaccinated, but if you're a Christian, you're, you're fine. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, that was a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> as of right now, maybe not in two weeks, but as of right now, that's a joke. But uh, you, you understand, the Lord can use you. The Lord can use you. The question is, do you want to be used by God? That's the real question. All right, let's take a break there. And uh, we'll start back up in about 10 minutes.